Hello and welcome to the bike show and to an episode that has lots of people riding bikes in their undergarments. All in the name of a good cause, of course. We also have a riding tip that is literally named after saving your life, among other things. But before we get to all that, we're going to catch up with all the bike news that's worth knowing. We have to start, I think, with the announcement from BMW that the next International GS Trophy will be held in Namibia in 2024. This event has earned itself a reputation as a seriously challenging competition and of course is the perfect way to promote what is arguably the most successful ever range of adventure bikes. South Africa has earned itself quite the reputation for teamwork, determination, never say die attitude and incredible riding skills in both the men's and women's competitions over the years. Nothing highlighted that more emphatically than 2022's edition of the trophy that took place in Albania. We featured that event heavily on the programme and how could we not because both the men's and women's teams from South Africa emerged from this spectacular location as overall victors. If you're interested in taking part on behalf of South Africa in Namibia, which is, let's be honest, almost home turf, then you need to get online or go into a BMW dealer and get yourself entered for the qualifying stages of the event. If you manage to be selected for the national team, I hope you can take the pressure though, because it will be higher than ever after so much success over the history of the GS Trophy. It just wouldn't do for the South Africans to be dethroned in the deserts of Namibia now, would it? No word as yet on the bikes that will be used, but you can pretty much guarantee that they will be the GS flagship of 2024, which, if rumours are to be believed, will be a 1300 by then. OK, let's swap the deserts and canyons of Namibia for the mountains, villages and hedges of the Isle of Man, where the extraordinary TT races take place every year, virus and world wars permitting. This bit of news is, well, it's, it's more of a recommendation, really. Those of you who already know and understand the allure of the public roads madness that is the TT will need no persuading to find time to watch this. But some of you may not yet have let yourselves be seduced by the sights and sounds of bike racing that takes place between the hedges, walls and houses of a quintessentially British island that lies between the UK mainland and Ireland. A new miniseries has just dropped on YouTube, courtesy of the official Isle of Man TT Races channel, and it takes a close inside look at this amazing event through the eyes of some of the big name competitors, past and present, commentators, fans, marshals and the like. I cannot say this strongly enough. Get on YouTube, find the Isle of Man TT Races channel and watch Between the Hedges, the miniseries, and be prepared to have your life changed. The TT is an event that should be on every motorcycle racing fan's bucket list. The first episode is live already and features a discussion as to who is the goat on the mountain course. It can only be one of two men really, Joey Dunlop or John McGuinness, McPint as he's also known. Mr Dunlop is, unfortunately, no longer around to contribute his thoughts on the matter, but the Morecambe missile is, and he's in no doubt who the greatest of all time really is. I'm not king of the mountain. Joey Dunlop's king of the mountain. He's the proper king of the mountain. To be fair, when you look at it, I'm not in the same league as what Joey was. You know, Joey was was one step ahead of me. Like when he was 48, he jumped off a big SP1 superbike and jumped on a 125, and if I jumped on a 125 now, it'd disappear up my ass crack, you know. I, I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. If the Isle of Man is an iconic event, and it most certainly is, then we have news from an iconic American brand. Harley Davidson has released details of its 2023 model lineup and its own festival celebrating being in the motorcycle business for 120 years. Most of its cruiser range has seen the addition of cruise control and there's also been some 
minor tweaks to the new adventure models. So far, so ordinary. However, there is also the return of a model that disappeared three years ago. The breakout is a soft tail with an aggressive demeanor. And for me, it's one of the best looking of all the new models. It now has the larger Milwaukee 8 117 V-twin motor with 100 horsepower and 167 newton meters. Usefully, there's also an extra five and a half liters of fuel, so 18.9 liters in the restyled tank, and you now have the option of specking traction control to go with your keyless ignition, LED lighting, and that cruise control. Another model that has had its appeal improved enormously via some relatively modest styling changes is the freewheeler. The trike now looks much more hardcore thanks to a lot of black for the front end as a whole and for the wheels. The rear pair of wheels have also been bumped up from apologetic 15s to proud 18 inches and this has done a lot to change the overall look from moping mobility scooter to monstrously mean trike or something like that. Alliteration aside though, it does now look like something you'd be happy to wear an open face helmet on, whereas it was always a full face lid, darkest of dark visors kind of ride in the past, at least for me. As you'd expect of an anniversary year, as significant as 120, there's a range of limited edition models to celebrate the birthday. And so there's special versions of the Fat Boy, Heritage Classic, Road Glide, Street Glide, Tri Glide, and Ultra Limited. These all get special paint, pinstripes, powertrain inserts, Art Deco logos, and gold stitching for the seat logos. Topping the list of the anniversary models, though, is the CVO Road Glide Limited Anniversary. That it sets itself apart from the lesser birthday specials with a more intricately detailed paint job hand-painted detailing, Alcantara leather seats, and a production run limited to just 1,500 units. The price for such exclusivity is a not inconsiderable 1.1 million rand. And finally, if you are part of the Harley-Davidson scene and a fan of the brand, then you should be really looking right now at booking tickets to an accommodation in Milwaukee because the 120th celebrations will be culminating there during the four nights leading up to June the 16th. Milwaukee is the home of Harley, so obviously you can visit the very impressive museum or take a factory tour, grab yourself a demo ride or three and partake in the general festivities, not forgetting the live music that will be fronted by the likes of the Foo Fighters and Green Day. On a much, much smaller scale, it seems there might be cause for celebration on the other side of the world, in the Czech Republic to be exact. In 1924, 15 years before the Second World War intervened to halt production, Burmaland was making distinctive motorcycles to the designs of Albin Liebisch, with such forward-thinking features as all welded tubular steel frames and solid cast aluminium wheels. However, if you've ever seen one of these bikes in a museum, and having visited a good few motorcycle museums myself over the years, I can tell you that they are often to be found in the larger ones somewhere or other, and you will have noticed then that they are distinctive because they are often displayed in their signature red and yellow colors. But much more eye-catchingly than that, you cannot fail to have been impressed by their length. Officially recorded as the production motorcycle with the longest ever wheelbase at 3.2 meters, the Burmaland was produced in a two-seat sport variant, a three-seat touring option, and finally a four-seat long touring model. There was even an experimental model designed to carry four soldiers that had a second gearbox operated by one of the passengers to give a total of nine gears. Unfortunately, the length of the old bike will not be a feature of the new one. A cruiser that will, however, sport the same vibrant colors, a similar welded tubular chassis and cast alley wheels. The new bike will first be made in a highly restricted production run of just 10 units that will go for a touch over a million rand. 
but we are assured more variants will follow. The company has even produced an electric concept version, so perhaps this is one niche manufacturer with the wherewithal to stay the course. Personally, I think they'd have an even better chance of survival, or indeed success, if they took a look at making road legal models that could trade on their forefathers' ability to transport up to four people at the same time. Let's face it, there are plenty of places on the planet at the moment where multiple people are being squeezed onto the one bike. Why not try and make that existing, undoubtedly illegal practice as practical and safe as possible? That would be a service to humanity, not just to 10 very rich customers who like red and yellow cruisers. Unfortunately, I don't think that's very likely to happen. Though much more likely is the return of the bike show after this short ad break.